Hello, and we are excited to welcome you to the artist talk by Nadia Huggins. The exhibition is on an island, and it is generously funded by the Missouri Arts Council and the Katherine Hyde Charitable Trust. Uh, the show has been extended to October 15th with extended hours as well from September 23rd with gallery hours <coughs> 9 to 6 p.m. Monday through Thursday and 8 to 4 p.m. on Friday. Normal gallery hours will resume as of September 24th to October 5th from 9 to 5 p.m. The show will be open from 10 to 2 p.m. on special Saturdays, including Sept uh, Saturday, September 5th, Saturday, September 12th, and Saturday, September 19th. There will be a reception today, so we hope you can join us. And that will be right next door in the Spiva Arts Gallery in the Fine Arts Building from 12 to 1 p.m. However, please keep in mind that we'll need to do social distancing, so probably a max of 10 attendees at a time. Uh, this presentation will be recorded, so please silence your phones if you've not done so already. There will be a community arts project uh, in, done in response to this exhibition as of Saturday um, from the times of 10 to 2 p.m., and it is public. The, it will be called The Boundary, and it will be exploring themes of boundaries, limits, and breaking through. The associate professor, Dr. Mintert, will lead participants to draw themselves breaking boundaries and how they break boundaries will be done per their interpretation. These images will be combined into a pre-made mural of water imagery taken from Nadia Huggins' exhibition. They will be posted on the windows of the Fine Arts Building, which will be visible from both the outside and inside. Nadia Huggins both lives and works in the St. Vincent um, and the Grenadines and uses this region as a case study to explore the terrestrial interior of the island to the depths of the sea. Um, this was discussed in her TED talk um, on the Port of Spain entitled um, What's Beyond the Boundary of the Shoreline. She uses both documentary and conceptual practices um, through photography and it goes beyond the tourist conception of the Caribbean in order to explore how the both land and sea affects the socio-political and cultural dynamics of the island. Uh, themes she explores in her work are identity, memory, and belonging to the landscape of the sea. She has been showcased in many exhibitions, including Human Stories, Circa No Future at the Now Gallery in London, Relational Undercurrents, Art of the Caribbean Archipelago in California, New York, Maine, and Florida. A Love Ethic, which was part of the Addis Abba Ethiopia, or sorry, a part of the Wedge Curatorial Projects in Addis Abba Ethiopia. The Jamaica Biennale in 2017 in Kingston, Jamaica. Um, Color Pays, Photo Photo Amnalis um, Festival 2017 in Bavo, France, Caribbean Queer Visualities in Belfast and Glasgow, UK. And she is co-founder of the ARC magazine and One Drop in the Ocean, which is an initiative to bring awareness to um, marine debris. So without further ado, um, please give a round of applause to Nadia Huggins. Thank you so much, Taylor. I'm gonna try and um, work my way through the technology of this. So bear with me, guys. Um, I first of all just want to thank Christine Bentley, who is unfortunately not able to make it um, today because she's been ill, but she has been the one who has actually helped me put all of this together and Christine has worked tirelessly with me and has been very patient in getting everything um, up and running. So thank you so much, Christine, for making this happen and of course to the university for being able to host this event and the funders who have made this happen without the money. I mean, it's never, <laughs> it's never possible to make these things happen. So thank you all so much. I'm so extremely grateful to have this opportunity. Um, I mean, I think Taylor's kind of given a general overview of what I've done. So let me just try and get into this. Just bear with me, I have to share my screen.
Okay. Can everyone still see me? Hi Kyle, just making sure we could still hear me and see, see me somewhere. Um. Hey Kyle, just making sure that you could still see my face <laughs> along with the slideshow while I'm doing this. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go into it and hopefully, yeah, everything will come together. All right, good. I can see it now. Thanks. Uh, so, I mean, just a little bit about me. Um, I was born in Trinidad and Tobago, but I grew up in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. My parents have been sentient. I've lived, work, I've been born, I've done everything on an island pretty much. It's, it's all I know. Um, I've never lived outside the Caribbean. So I guess you could say that I embody um, what it means to be a Caribbean person in every sense with that regard. Um, I, I am a self-taught photographer. I have no formal training whatsoever. And um, I kind of dabble between the world of photography and graphic design. I'm like, I guess like Clark Kent, I'm like a designer by day and a photographer by night. Um, and I've been actively working as a serious practice in photography since 2010. Although I would say I've become conscious of photography being a plausible medium for me since 2002. Um, and as Taylor mentioned earlier, my work um, sort of merges documentary and conceptual practices. And my, my focus has always sort of been on the everydayness of what it is, what it means to be a Caribbean person, what it's like to have that Caribbean experience. And just, you know, just kind of focusing on those sort of like seemingly banal um, types of experiences and moments. Um, a lot of my work explores a lot of themes surrounding, you know, belonging. I've, I've always, you know, in spite of growing up in a place like this, I've always had a sense that I've never quite belonged. Um, so I think that's kind of always been a very central theme um, or a central kind of focus point in a lot of my work, like trying to understand where it is I belong, like do I belong here, um, getting a, a sense of what my identity is and working a lot from ideas around my memories of being in a place like this, growing up in a place like this. Um, I try to explore lots of these ideas in a contemporary way and um, I'm very interested in representing um, that Caribbean landscape and sea uh, into a way um, that recontextualizes the way we're perceived um, outside of that kind of like tourist um, economy. I'm just making sure you guys are still seeing the screen. Um, so, I mean, just to kind of get right into it, the main thing that's really attracted me to photography in the beginning was just that ability to edit and manipulate color. I think you know, growing up in a, in a place like St. Vincent, it's, you know, that you have an, an island is basically the ultimate boundary because, I mean, you drive to the edge of the shoreline and that's it. You either have to get a plane or a boat or a swim, which I wouldn't recommend, but I mean, that's, that's, kind, of, <laughs> that's kind of what we're working with here. That's, there's that physical boundary line that exists. And a lot of the things we see on a day-to-day -day basis, to me, at, I mean, at that age, I, I was getting really tired of just seeing a lot of imagery, um, you know, of like perfect blue skies or like perfect grass. And um, I found something about it really dull. And when I realized that I could actually like manipulate color and start to experiment in these kind of fun ways, I just like dive right into it. And I, I was really heavily influenced by a lot of films growing up at that time. Um, I had wanted to study film, but unfortunately, never really had the opportunity at that time to leave and do this. So I kind of went into the next best thing um, at that age, which was advertising. Audio, yes, um, can you just fine and see you on screen. So just okay. letting me know, thanks. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, 
Yes, I mean, I, you know, I, I got into advertising at that age and, um, you know, like, of course, like a lot of the things that the clients were coming to me at that time, they wanted me to replicate that kind of like tourist image of what it meant to be on an island and just very kind of cliche images. So when I realized I could actually manipulate the mood and color of what I was doing, I got really excited by that. And, you know, I am um, looking at a lot of films at that time, like in the mood for love and just seeing how, um, how filmmakers were actually playing with color and light and the way that they were able to sequence these things um, in a way to create, to, to get an emotion out of people. And that really um, drew me into photography. So I am, um, I, you know, I, I, I had started experimenting at the time. I mean, like these images on the screen, this was actually like an, you know, an original project I had worked on at the time just using my phone and hipstamatic. Um, you know, that was kind of in the beginning when like iPhones and iPhoneography became a thing. Um, and that, that was really exciting to me because I got to experiment without having to think too much about, you know, these technical kind of hangups that we have about photography sometimes. I've always been just sort of really more interested in focusing on the story, focusing on the mood and not, not to discredit the importance of having technical knowledge, of course, you should always have that. But to me, that story was much more important because that wasn't getting out to the world. Um, and you know, like a lot of the, the imagery I was consuming at that point, it's like sort of like very Western imagery. Um, I was really heavily drawn to like album covers. Like I loved the work of Storm Thorgerson, you know, just like really super cool, like surreal types imagery, you know, like you know, like Led Zeppelin covers and the cranberries and all these types of things. And I was like, wow, this is so interesting to see how people can take an album or a sound and put a visual to it. And something about that really spoke to me at that age, you know? So again, I mean, these are just sort of like kind of snaps of like the world that I live in. Um, and a lot of what I was doing at the time was just responding to my environment. I wasn't going out with like a set intention of like focusing on one particular um, theme or one particular idea. Was just, I went into it knowing like I wanted to, I wanted to communicate my reality in a way um, that felt moody, that felt surreal in some ways. Um, and that was just looking at things, I suppose, in a different way um, to what I was experiencing every day, you know what I mean? We, we all like have to go to the bus terminal. Nobody wants to go to the bus terminal at like four o'clock, it's hot. It's just like, you know, sweaty. There's tons of school kids. Um, so it's like, how, how do you work within with those limitations and create an image of it that takes you out of that reality in some way. And I think that was kind of my ma mindset um, going into a lot of the work. It's like, how do I escape from this reality I was living in and, and create something new and fresh for me to just cope with being in a place that I felt as though I didn't belong. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think photography for me at that time and still, I mean, today was just really an opportunity to activate my imagination in a fresh way and I think that like I mean just kind of speaking on this idea of boundaries I mean while I live in a space that's physically um, there's a physical boundary there's a limitation as to where you can go I think that boundary has always just existed in our minds and I think that's across the board it doesn't matter if you live in like uh, a continent where you can drive across the border and you're in another state I mean or like you're on an island or if you're in space it's the, the boundary is in your mind and the thing that pushes you beyond that sort of edge is your imagination. So you can create that world in your own way, even within the confines of a space. Um, and just, I mean, again, just thinking about that, that idea of confinement. I mean, photography in a way is a sort of confinement. I mean, you're working within a frame. It's like, it's a very subjective um, position that you have always. You can never really have an objective view of what you're doing um, because the frame, you know, it just kind of ends there. Like what happens outside of that frame is just as important as what's happening inside the frame. So I think, how do you, 
how do you work within those confines to tell your story, um, to express your emotions? You know, um, how, how do you kind of take, take that limitation and make it into something um, that could really have an impact on yourself and others? Because I mean, you know, creating art is such a selfish um, <laughs> kind of activity offhand, right? I mean, you're just trying to get things out, you're trying to express yourself, and then the people come after them. People see the work and then, and then it changes meaning. People put their own meaning um, as to what they see. But that initial, that initial interaction of you and the tool and the subject is always going to be very um, subjective. It's always going to be about you first. Um, it's always going to be your experience or what you put into it. So I think, um, yeah, once, once you start from there and you know that you're remaining true to your ideas and um, your vision, then once it gets to people, then it's just kind of out of your hands at that point. I mean, people will interpret things however they want to interpret and put their own sort of ideas in it. So again, these are just some more images. This is, I mean, most of these have been shot between uh, 2009, 2011, I would say. And again, I mean, just hopping around, responding to things that, you know, there's, I mean, the Caribbean is such a comical place. I mean, this, this goat is just chilling on this mattress on Christmas day. I mean, you know, it's like, there's just, there's just so many unusual things that we um, encounter here on a day-to-day -day basis. And I was, I mean, I think like, there's always a sense of humor in a lot of what I do, I mean, sometimes it might go over people's heads, but I always try to find a way to like cleverly say something kind of funny because I mean, I think that's also been a very intrinsic part of what it means to be a Caribbean person. We just, we've kind of figured out a way to laugh at everything. It, it's good and bad sometimes. I mean, it's obviously a distraction technique that we've adopted um, to living in spaces like this, uh, but I think, I think it keeps us sane and it keeps, it keeps things fresh for us. Um, so the, this, again, kind of going back to this idea of like working haphazardly, I, I started thinking a lot about social media. I mean, at that time, we didn't really call it social media. It was just like a platform to share what we were doing or what I was doing. Um, and, you know, this was a, a little bit before Instagram had come out and Facebook had really taken off the way it has. And it, you know, I come from an island where there isn't, um, there isn't really an arts community. I mean, now that things are kind of happening slowly, like very much in its nascent stages. But at the time, I didn't have a support network. I didn't have a community. Um, I was fortunate enough to have parents who were creative and who completely supported me in my endeavors. Um, but outside of that, I didn't really have anyone to interact with to be like, okay, this is how you take a photograph. You know, this is how, this is the type of color you use. This is how you compose an image. Like I didn't, I didn't have that kind of engagement on a day-to-day -day basis. And I ended up turning to the internet and I found this fantastic website at the time called Deviant Arts, which I know has like changed into something quite different now, but in the beginning, it was, it was so exciting because I had met all these people who were pretty much at the same level as me um, or better or, or worse or whatever. It didn't, it didn't really matter at the time because it was just so cool to have a creative community that I can engage with and share my work and get honest feedback on things and you know, like learn different techniques. And so I, I, I was really excited to just go out every day and just shoot and um, share it on that platform. And, you know, um, really kind of, it helped me grow tremendously as an artist. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's complete, like some of the relationships I've built on that network, I still, I still keep in touch with people. I mean, that would have been like 12, 13 years ago. So it's really wonderful to have that kind of community um, when you live in spaces like this, where you don't really have access to so much. I mean, now things are kind of shifting in the world, obviously with the pandemic and we're all forced to communicate with each other in this way, um, which I think, I mean, you know, there's pros and cons to it, but I think the ultimate thing about it is that you 
could have a sense of belonging. You can build that community. Um, you can engage with people who are thinking similarly to you. You know, you might, you might feel like a bit of an outsider wherever you are. I think that's a universal feeling for many. It doesn't matter if you live on an island or in a, on a continent. Um, but, you know, utilize those tools, I would say, and definitely try to, to let it help you grow in the ways that you need to grow. So, yeah, I mean, that, that platform kind of changed things tremendously for me. And I started looking at it. I started referring to it as like a little window because um, it was like a, it kind of gave people an opportunity to see into my world that they would not have necessarily been able to see before. And it was, it was so exciting because I could share this kind of like Caribbean experience with people um, who had no understanding of what it was like to be here. And then suddenly it was like, um, you know, they, they can get us, they can get a sense of my place and how, the people around me looked and how people would speak and how their body language and all these types of things. So, and it really kind of gives people a better understanding um, of each other when, when you have that opportunity to share. I mean, now with Instagram, there's just like an oversaturation of images. We can see what anybody is doing from any corner of the world at any time. Um, and it becomes a bit much, but um, I, th I still think there's value in it. Like, I, I think I might be one of the few people that actually enjoy seeing people's food pics. I know everybody has like weird feelings about that. It's like, stop sharing like every moment of your day. But it's kind of nice to see the um, monotonous things that people are doing sometimes. I mean, it, it really gives you an understanding of what that human experience is at the end of the day. I mean, if there's, I mean, the whole point of us, I think, being on this earth is to have that connection with each other. And like, however we're able to do that, like, I think we need to just seize the opportunity and, and um, you know, make that work for us to, to build the types of relationships that we do. Okay, so <clears throat> by 2011, I started kind of changing my perspective on how I was um, thinking about photographing, like what I was, where I was interested in going as a photographer. I mean, I think at that point I started taking things quite seriously and I'm like, okay, maybe I do have like a, a future in this somehow when I could actually start to focus in a bit um, deeper into the things that were important to me. Um, and maybe if I were able to share these things with other people that they could benefit from it as well. Um, but like I said, I mean, once you put the images out there, how people react to it, how people feel as a result of it is, is no longer in your control at the end of the day. Um, so this series is called Black and Blue. And I think what, this, this was shot in St. Lucia. Um, I think this is when I started to realize that I, was deep digging into a lot of my own memories of what it was like growing up on an island. Um, you know, like I used to play football on the beach with like a group of boys all the time. Like I would be the only girl in the group playing with boys. And I never, I've always felt a sense of belonging in, in those kind of um, interactions because I'm like, I can play football just as well, or soccer, sorry. Remember I'm speaking to the American audience. Um, you know, I, I, I'm playing with these guys and I feel a sense of belonging with them. I'm playing just as well as they are. Like we have that camaraderie against with each other. Um, and I think that the feeling of seeing other people do that as I get older, I always feel like I have, I feel like I have the right to have access to those spaces in a way because I understand what it's like to do the things that they're doing. So I get very drawn to moments like this. Um, I guess that makes me feel a little bit nostalgic about that kind of experience of um, connecting to something that once was. Um, so I started photographing these boys and I think this would have been really the foundational work for me um, moving forward because it really helped me to kind of define a position and um, an idea of what it was I was drawn to. Um, and I realize the more connected you are to the subjects, um, the more impactful the work becomes. I mean, that's just the bottom line. Like for me, 
documenting my personal experiences and that relationship I have um, with people is so crucial. It's so crucial to have a relationship maintained in some way um, in order to make this type of work. Um, so, you know, I, I started experimenting a lot uh, with these images and the series is completely out of focus, um, which, you know, at the time, it felt like a little bit of a crazy thing to do, but I'm like, I, I wanted to start taking more risks and really just kind of focus more on composition. I started looking more at like just technique um, and lights. I mean, this is like 12 o'clock hot sun on an island. I, I don't know if anybody has been um, to the Caribbean, but if you, if you have, you'll totally understand what that means. It's like the hottest time of day. And there's, there's something, I mean, the light, the light is so different in every part of the world, right? If you look at the way light interacts um, with your camera, you know, it's going to be different in Scotland. It looks different in Missouri. Um, it's different in Australia. It's different in China. And in the Caribbean, we have such a distinctive um, type of light at certain times of day. And, you know, in the past, I've always kind of shied away from shooting at certain times because, you know, as a photographer, they teach you, like, you have to work at the magic hour. You have to work at this kind of light. And I think it's really important to set up those limitations for yourself and just, just completely ignore it sometimes and just go with your gut and respond to what could possibly happen when you do that. Um, so, I mean, this, yeah, so this series kind of came out of that idea for me to just really experiment and to start to focus on one um, sort of subject matter and theme um, around what I was interested in. And I, you know, I created a few other series after this, again, kind of focusing on things I was interested in, things that sort of stood out to me. And by 2014, 2013, uh, I had moved back to Simmons because I had, I would, prior to that, I was living in another island working um, in advertising. And I decided, you know, it was time to move back home and um, just kind of refocus where I was going and what I wanted to do. And at the time, you know, I bought an underwater camera, just like a little point and shoot Olympus TG2. Um, I had been swimming every day, I'd been kayaking a lot, and I was seeing all these things. And I was like, oh, that'd be kind of interesting to capture, but I don't have the tools to do it. But I mean, thankfully for technology now, we have access to so much that we wouldn't have had access to like 10, you know, 10, 12 years ago. So just that shift in like having like a, you know, just a basic consumer grade camera um, really made a huge difference in the way that I started seeing things. And I was like, I need to document these experiences I'm having on my daily swims. Like, it, it, it feels like such a familiar thing. It seems like such an obvious thing to do. Um, and then when I, at the time when I had like Googled um, underwater photography, Caribbean, whatever, you know, all I was just seeing was like images of like tourists swimming or like people scuba diving. It, it was never from the perspective of Caribbean people living and experiencing these spaces, which seem kind of crazy to me. I mean, it's not surprising. I mean, when you think about how the, the tourist market works and who it's catered for at the end of the day. But for me, I was, I was so much more interested in like placing ourselves into the conversation. Um, and I mean, that's kind of how, that's sort of how I ended up just working in the water. I just wanted I just wanted us to be seen in that space for a change um, and not make it about everybody else, you know? Um, so this series, uh, Circa No Future, basically documents, you know, several groups of boys, mostly adolescent, you know, between, I would say like nine, nine up to 19, um, over like periods of times. So, I mean, I've, I'm still sort of shooting bits and pieces of this project here and there. Um, but the, the, t the type of um, landscape I'm working with, um, there's, a, there's like a kind of a basalt um, rock structure that um, juts out from the bay that I live at. And it's, it's really crazy. It looks like Tetris blocks. So all of these young guys have basically claimed this as like the kind of amusement park in a way. 
so you know people climb up on it and like there are varying levels and they jump off and you know it's only it's only basically like the brave that go over there i mean anybody who <laughs> who has enough guts will go there um but you know i i, I spent my my younger days as well jumping off of these rocks with friends and it's just like really fun so i started going over there um with my camera and i noticed like oh, okay it's kind of cool like some guys jumping and hanging out and again like it felt to me at the time too typical too familiar it it kind of harps back to a lot of imagery of like black um caribbean men jumping off of boats, people throwing coins and, you know, like there's a very kind of performative act in it. Um, and it, something about it didn't really sit well with me just capturing that moment. Um, and I became really interested in that point where they break through that surface of the water and the performance ends. And then they kind of, they kind of reveal the sort of vulnerable, um, the sort of vulnerability to who they are. And it really kind of put, it put that kind of black um, male Caribbean experience in a different light for me, because I think growing up in a place like this, you know, you see a lot of guys hanging out in the streets and people make a lot of assumptions and, you know, people get quite critical um, without really understanding that, you know, like part of the masculine experience is also that vulnerability. I mean, with Caribbean men, there's always a performance happening when they're outside of the space. Um, and for me, I think it was just really important to be able to show them in this way um, that was, you know, totally opposite to that and just completely unexpected. So, you know, I mean, I, 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 I did a lot of work just kind of trying to capture that moment underneath. I mean, of course, there's like that, that build up to it, to all these images to give you a sense of context of where they are. Um, who these guys are. And I mean, this is, again, the performative moment. Um, but this this kind of key point where the, the sea really just kind of has no, um, no care for who you are, like what you do. Like we, we are physically unable to survive in this space. Um, so however we interact in that space is going to just bring out our ultimate core, um, the, the complete essence of who you are as a person. Um, because when you're just kind of focused on survival, when you're just kind of focused on like returning to the surface to get, get that breath, you know, um, all that happens in between there is just how do I get that breath? But yeah, there's a, there's a type of vulnerability that happens um, to the body, Ma male, women, you know, men, women, it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, this, this work really just kind of focused on these, these boys in particular. And, um, I mean, I, I think you can see like a clear kind of jump from this body of work into this, you know, I mean, there's again, that performance and sort of blurring that idea of who we are into that like moment of vulnerability. Is everyone still following along with me so far? Can I get a thumbs up? <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so I think so sort of simultaneously again, working on this series, you know, I was photographing a lot of different things at that time. Um, you know, it's like, I think I was trying to create my own sort of visual ecosystem of things happening in the sea. So like on one hand, I had these boys. On the other hand, I was focusing on myself. You know, I was documenting sort of like movement of ropes, like the, the tying and untying of ropes based on like buoyancy and tides, um, you know, like looking at fish, looking at the horizon, just really just trying to fully explore everything within my realm um, and create this sort of little ecosystem of a, a world, a, a, a world of what it's like to um, be in the sea. And um, the series is called Transformations. It started off as, it started off as an idea, um, but the, the overall body of work is called Fighting the Currents. And I kind of became obsessed with creating this film in my head about, um, 
you know, entering the water and like being pulled up by a riptide and then going underwater and then going through these series of transformations and then re-emerging in this like foreign space in the sea where I had no view of any islands around me. Um, so like I was completely disoriented and just kind of use, I use that narrative um, as a kind of way to define um, different bodies of work. Um, and it's, uh, I guess it, 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 for me, like I, I tend to work a lot with metaphors um, and this idea, I mean, like a lot of Caribbean parents will tell you, yeah, if you ever um, go in the sea and, um, you know, a current, you get caught in a current, you don't fight it. You just have to go with the flow. And that kind of idea, something about it just spoke so beautifully to me. And I, I like this idea. I'm like, well, what if I didn't fight the current? Where would I end up? You know, and I was like, what if I go underwater and I can never resubmerge? But what if I resubmerge and I don't see any land? Like, so it, in my mind, I think it was just like that idea of like playfulness um, and just creating a, a narrative to work from. And this series um, came out of that, that basic idea. And I started documenting a lot of like the reefs and just like marine organisms and different types of things around the beach um, that I was swimming at. Um, because, you know, like I spent, I spent pretty much most of my life swimming in this bay. And when you spend that much time in one place, you definitely see changes happening over time. Um, and I had noticed like a lot of the coral um, was becoming bleached. Like the, you know, like the reefs didn't look the same that like they used to. The types of fish were changing. Uh, there were more sea urchins. Um, in certain areas, which understand that like, if the pH changes in the water, like these just kind of come out in full force. Um, so, you know, like, it, in a way I was documenting these sort of changes as a result of the changes happening globally. Um, and then I started thinking about how, how do I, um, you know, how do I merge myself into this world in a, in a way that seemed kind of familiar to me. I mean, there's, we, ha we have a strong carnival culture in the Caribbean. Um, so a lot of, I think a lot of my influence directly or indirectly comes from that in some ways. Um, and I've, I've always kind of been drawn to this idea of like masking myself. I think every time I've photographed myself in anything, um, I'm always trying to figure out a way to conceal parts of myself. And I think that's a way that as an artist, like I'm grappling with my own identity. I'm kind of grappling with like how I appear to people, like what am I trying to hide? Like, or who do I want to become? Um, yeah, out, outside of, of what the norm is. So this, this series basically took shape out of that kind of thinking. Um, I know it's a diptych, so there's two pieces sort of separate from each other. And again, I was thinking about a lot of these ideas of like buoyancy and what it means, like how, how things move in the water. So I kind of like that idea of like having this space between the images that, you know, like there's like a bit of a tension between things almost merging, but not quite merging because as a human being, you're just never able to fully merge into that kind of environment. Um, but still, um, it, you know, like it just, it just feels like, there's a possibility for something else to exist there. How can we, how can we, um, how can we fully merge with nature in a way um, that informs who we are as people? So this is just some, um, it's 11 pieces in the series, um, different parts of my body. Um, and this is how I usually display them. So yeah. Uh, this image, I think, is, is in the exhibition that you might have seen. Um, so this project is called Every Horizon Looks the Same. And again, just kind of going back to that idea of like me documenting different things simultaneously. So in between me photographing myself, I'm like also shooting the horizon. And the title basically came from that, that idea that there's so many cliche images um, that we all get drawn to. Um, why is it that these things... Um, move us so much you know why is it that every time I go to the beach 
I photograph the same horizon. I mean, the light changes, the tide changes, like, of course, there's always going to be those subtle changes in the environment. Um, but that idea of that horizon line, the sky, the sea, that's the same. And, um, you know, I started thinking about like, well, how does the horizon look, the, that ocean sky horizon look in like different parts of the world? Um, and I got my friend, uh, a J Archer, to actually help me build this website. It's, it's no longer up, unfortunately, but um, it was basically you just, you know, whatever part of the world you are, if you go to the beach, you submit your horizon. It was just called everyhorizonlookstheSame.com. And, you know, people from all over the world can upload their horizon. So I was like basically trying to create this record of horizons around the world. Um, I can't remember how much I had in the end. I, I mean, I had a couple of thousand well. Um, but I mean, my hope was to basically like create this like map of the world, just like horizons. Um, and again, I mean, just trying to think of ways to work with that sort of like platform of the computer of, you know, working with technology in kind of fresh and exciting ways within the confines of being in a space like this. Like how do I create a conversation with people outside of this island? Um, so yeah, I mean, this, this project was kind of like the, the end of the narrative where I resubmerge from this underwater world. And then suddenly I'm like, um, you know, I'm in this foreign space where I can't see land and every horizon looks the same. So, um, and this, and this kind of interaction with everybody sharing their horizon, it's like, it's meant to kind of play in this concept of disorienting me. So, and I mean, again, this, this idea of the horizon speaks to that universal experience of what it means to be human, what it's, um, the things that we're drawn to at the end of the day. So kind of flash forward um, to 2016, <clears throat> I was uh, commissioned uh, by Small Acts, which is a, um, a critical journal based in the Caribbean. And we, they held a symposium um, at Columbia University for this idea of like what it means to be queer in the Caribbean or like visually how that's represented in some way um and you know there was like a lot of back and forth about this idea of course like everybody was just um everybody was kind of hesitant in defining what um what that idea of queerness is or sexuality or gender um because most caribbean artists i think don't necessarily want to be bound up in these labels um when it comes to that and you know there's still lots of um there's still a lot of hesitations and a lot of um, a lot of animosity um, against people based on their sexuality and gender. Um, you know, I mean, we we live in a, a very conservative space at the end of the day, and I think this has. Um, this, this affects a lot of different artists in the way that they make work. I mean, I, I can speak for myself. Sexuality and gender has never been at the forefront of what I do, I think. I mean, of course, being a woman who is using a camera, who is interacting in a certain space in a particular way, it will always inform a very particular kind of relationship um, that you have with a subject. But that relationship comes through in the spaces that you have access to and the way that you interact with the subject. Um, so I think this was probably maybe the first project where I had directly sort of addressed this idea of what um, gender, you know, that, that idea around perceptions around gender and sexuality. And the piece is called Is That a Boy? Is That a Boy? And it's a play on words. Um, and on your right hand side, there's a, a buoy that you use to kind of tie boats to and then the top of my head. And I became, I was really kind of interested in that way that people made assumptions um, about me based on just what they saw. Um, and I think, I mean, one of the most hilarious things about the sea, like a lot of times if you, you know, in shore and you're looking out, you'll either, you'll see someone swimming and you're like, oh, is that a boy? Or is that like a person swimming? But you're never quite sure. And then you realize like afterwards it's just like a piece of plastic or a buoy or something. So um, 
and again, like kind of playing on that sense of humor um, that we have in the Caribbean, um, but also just looking at the ways that we objectify people based on the way they look and the types of assumptions that we start to make. Um, you know, I, I have an experience every time I go to the beach, I literally have like a line of people looking at me get in. Um, Cause I think, you know, like I, I have a lot of gay and stuff sometimes when I get in and people ask the most obvious question. They're like, is that a man or a woman? And I mean, I'm wearing a bikini, <laughs> you know, it's, it's the most bizarre thing, but um, they, they know, they know what the answer is to the question. But I think Caribbean people also have this way where the reason they're asking the question is not because they want an answer, it's because they want you to know that they recognize you and you look very different. Um, so that's kind of something I've grappled with for a long time. And, you know, I mean, in spite of whatever my sexuality is or what gender I identify as, the thing that's always struck me with this, um, and I guess it's been kind of unnerving, is because I have alopecia. The reason I have no hair is because I've lost it. And people have always kind of made assumptions about what um, I choose to identify as based on that. Um, and I just think it's so crazy. It's just, there's like a certain level of insensitivity to the way people will engage with you without really asking any more questions. Um, they just make these assumptions based on your physical appearance. Um, and I think it's difficult, but it's interesting for me because it's really kind of spoken to the way um, that people choose to see things without really delving more into it. And I feel as though like I have a responsibility to make this type of work sometimes just to remind people that you can think, you can think a little bit deeper about what you're, um, what you're judging, what the type of assumptions you make. And I mean, this, this goes beyond, um, you know, gender and sexuality. I think it comes down to race. I think it comes down to issues around class. Like it's, it's really, it's, it's really just kind of one of those things that I think we always have to check ourselves and really think about um, who, we, who we're asking the questions to and why we're asking them. Is it that, you know, there's some sort of like deep level of discomfort we're feeling within ourselves that makes us um, say these things to other people or make these assumptions about other people. And, we're, and we know we're all guilty of it at the end of the day. Um, but it's, I think that questioning and self-awareness is really important. So, I mean, all that work just kind of gives you a very broad um, idea of what I've done in the past. In terms of the collections of work in this exhibition, I mean, it's really, when Christine approached me to do it, she asked me, you know, like, just come up with whatever you want, you propose something. And I didn't want to just share like one particular body of work. I really wanted to be able to give you guys like a overview of my practice as a whole. Um, and the thing I guess I've been realizing recently that I've been doing is kind of moving between this idea of the sea and like terrestrial landscapes and just kind of exploring that liminal space, like what it means, what does it mean to physically and emotionally embody um, being on an island? Um, so I think a lot of a lot of the works in this exhibition kind of move between that space of land and sea to give a kind of a very broad sense um, of what, what a Caribbean space looks like. I mean, this, this is just one, it's just one place that I live on, Simmons and the Grenadines, but I think there are lots of similarities throughout the islands. I mean, the Caribbean is not just islands as well. I mean, it's also a continent as like Guyana, Suriname, um, you know, the northern coast of Venezuela, all these places embody it, but there is an essence of who we are um, as people, what our experiences are like. Um, certain sort of like visual cues and symbols that exist across the region. And to me, it's really important to document these things and to create a record of what life is like in a kind of a post-colonial way. I mean, I think a lot of the imagery um, that would have been shared of and about the Caribbean um, would have been done with a, a very specific focus in mind. Um, 
you know, photography is still something quite new to the region in the sense that we don't really have a very long standing history of photography and the way it was introduced in the Caribbean was to really just kind of reframe the way um, the space was viewed after slavery. So um, now a lot of us um, working within the arts are like trying to undo that narrative and point the lens back at ourselves and point that lens in a way that is not focused on just being like, hey, come to my island. Like we have like free like pina coladas and like beaches. I mean, we have that sometimes too, but I'm just saying there's a, there's a whole other world outside of that. And I think it's important for us to really place ourselves um, visually into the world so that we, people can understand what, um, what our experiences are like. So I think a lot of the work kind of looks at those moments. Um, and I, I mean, for me, I'm always sort of looking for that little bit of magic um, that that's there in the everyday. I mean, I think these kind of scenes, like we're familiar with them. Um, nobody ever wants to go up to a guy digging up coals in like a, <laughs> again, like 12 o'clock hot sun with like fire and smoke. Nobody wants to be there, but I'm like, but the, there's something quite beautiful and simple and elegant about these types of moments to me. Um, because, you know, it's like, it's like these sort of like little magical, um, magical moments that really embody who we are and like what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm just gonna run through some of the images here. You know, again, just this kind of harps back to like, like my early days of, of photographing, just responding, responding to scenes as they happen and not so much focusing on one particular idea or um, body of work. And I mean, even, even in the midst of things being quite beautiful and seeming quite tropical and magical, um, there, is, there is a kind of a backstory happening as well where I'm thinking about, um, thinking about the ways like things deteriorate over time. Like, I mean, this is somebody's home um, that they might have abandoned. I mean, like a, a very typical story in the Caribbean is like, you know, family, someone might have died in their family and like um, the rest of the family members would have tried to move to the US or Canada or the UK and you know, the house, the, the property just runs down and you know, you, you look at this and you think, oh, that's quite beautiful to see like this sort of like um, natural scene playing on the back. But again, like thinking about what's happening outside of that frame, there's a whole story leading up to this moment. Um, so, I mean, the image just pulls you in at the end of the day, but it's really the story that happens outside of that frame. Um, that's crucial um, to understand um, what the experience is like um, being in places like this. And again, just, um, just pretty much responding to my environment, um, thinking of ways, uh, sometimes purely aesthetic, like just thinking of ways to, to frame images, really been focusing on composition a lot um, and trying to create this sort of surreal world of, um, of where I live. This is a very good friend of mine who um, I, I spent a lot of time on the beach with. His name is Nato. And he basically would take me around everywhere and guide me. Um, as to how, you know, to survive in the water if anything were to happen. And just like a tragic turn of events last year, he was murdered. Um, and, it, you know, I mean, the, you know, these are, these are people that I have relationships with or had relationships with in some way. And they're an intrinsic part of what my experience is like being here. Um, and it's, it's so important for me to, um, to be able to create a record of them and what they meant um, to me and what they mean to other people as well um, in ways like this, you know, this is him like doing what he does all the time, just out in his boats, um, yeah, rowing or, I mean, those, those who would have grown up here would know, know him in this way. So it's important for me to have a record of the people that matter in spaces like this. And again, just, um, 
during a time of photographing a lot in the water, just documenting different boats and thinking about them as like kind of like sculptural objects and how how they could be seen in different ways and and um, yeah and then again um, looking looking again at the kind of effects um, of just man <laughs> you know um, thinking about I've th been thinking a lot about marine debris I, I think um, Taylor had mentioned in the beginning that I have a project called one drop in the ocean so of course you're interacting in this space all the time I'm swimming all the time and outside of each frame of what I'm shooting is some piece of trash and you know whether it's plastic or a plastic fork or like anything so a lot of times I actually see pieces of trash floating past me and I think this scene kind of stuck out to me because it was like it, it kind of felt like this strange kind of Michael Jordan moment where you think the shoe was going to levitate and like do something really fantastic but then you you know you think about it a lot deeper and it's somebody lost their shoe and so many of these things end up in the ocean and not just from here I mean we the way that um marine debris works is like basically from every part of the world like we have trash coming into our beaches all the time there is literally not a single beach on this island that does not have some form of trash and um, washing up in its shores and it, it feels like a impossible cause um to clean all these beaches to raise the awareness but i think for me, it's really important to incorporate this into the work because this is now a part of our reality. This is, this is a part of our landscape. I mean, most of these like beautiful sort of places I go to, whether it's in the interior of the island, a coastline in the water, there's literally always some sort of presence of plastic or marine debris or trash in some way. Um, and this, yeah. I mean, it, it really kind of, I, I hope with this type of work, it actually kind of makes people think a little bit more about what they're consuming, how they're disposing of it, um, and where it's going, because it, it ends up all over the world. I mean, it's not just the Caribbean. The currents literally take things everywhere. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's kind of like my sort of like ultimate social cause um, from the type of work that I'm doing now, thinking a lot about the environment and how to preserve it. And that's it. And if you guys have any questions, I'll try and stop sharing this. What was your big break as an artist, would you say? in terms of opportunity? <laughs> huh. um, I would say in 2011, um, Christopher Cozier, my, I mean, I, I call him my mentor. I don't know if he's okay with me calling him that. He had curated me into a show, a show in DC um, with a bunch of other Caribbean artists. And I think that was like, the first time I was taken seriously with what I was doing and um, gotten some level of credibility and um, a lot of the people that were in that show um, I've been able to build relationships with now and really create a community and I think we, um, it's been um, it's been a really good network um, to help me kind of like launch off from there. One more question. Um, I feel like a lot of artists that have arrived don't really talk about their experiences with rejection or like mass calls for entry or a lot of the scams with like pay to exhibit and uh, opportunities yeah. like that. So I know once you break through those and tend to get opportunities, they cascade into more opportunities. But what would you say to students or young artists that like don't necessarily or are more bombarded with the rejections or the mass calls and can't really weave through that to hold um, I, I mean, I would say make a list of all the things that you're really interested in. Um, like I, at the time when I started um, sharing my work, like I was looking at like all these online publications that I thought was really cool, like, you know, juxtapose and um, it's nice that and the stuff that I was kind of aspiring to and I would submit to them you know, like 95% of things you get rejected from. 
but it's no reason to stop trying. Um, I think you just need to put it, make a rejection folder and put it in there and then really try to assess, is this what I want and why do you want to be in this particular thing? Um, does my aesthetic and idea fit into what these people are trying to do? Um, and, you know, just re be really brutally honest with yourself about that. Um, you know, and a year after you've kind of worked on some stuff, reapply again, you know, I mean, the, the rejection is a really, really, really important part of getting your work out there. There's absolutely no way of, um, there's no way of, of doing it. Otherwise, you, you have to fail at it. Um, but I think it helps to definitely make a list of things that you know aligns with your work and don't shoot low like I mean go for the thing that you think seems impossible because you just never know like sometimes um, a lot of these people judging these things might be looking for somebody who's not as well represented or um, who is who you know who doesn't have like Nat Geo Explorer behind their name like so like you know like it, it could it could um it's important to take those risks sometimes but i think definitely i mean compile a list of um things that you're interested in i mean i'm i'm in the process of doing that still like my friend melanie archer has been helping me um to kind of like make a list of like things that i want to be in and just <laughs> apply for it and i know it's, it's a sometimes it's a lot to have to spend you know, like forty dollars to submit one image um, to get rejected. It's it's a it's a risk. Um, but I think if you can like map out for the year, like realistically, what you would like to apply to, um, you know, cap have a budget for the year. Like, say I'm going to spend fifty or a hundred dollars or whatever applying for these things, and just apply to those things only. Do your research and apply to those. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, are those questions in the chat? that you can see from your end? Yes. Let me... Um... Let me see. Okay, Q&A, yeah. Um, what do you believe is the most challenging aspect of your work? Do you think it's more personal, more social of a challenge? Um, that's from Carla. Um, I mean, it changes. I think in the C, it was more of a physical challenge. <laughs> uh, but now I'm kind of, I guess I'm in a different space now because I'm shooting a lot on land. Um, and a lot of the places I would like to go. So for example, like more to the interior of the island, I don't feel as comfortable going alone. So I definitely need to have, you know, either somebody else with me or a team to work with. Whereas in the C, I'm, I feel kind of gutsy there. Like, I feel like it's my space. I don't need anybody around me. And I, I prefer to work alone when I'm working. Um, so now I'm kind of confronting this new challenge of like, I don't want to, you know, go out and shoot alone in the event that something were to happen and I wouldn't be able to protect myself or save myself um, from a possible situation. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's more, I guess that is a kind of a social challenge in some ways. Um, but also just the physical, the physical danger of what I do. I mean, the reality is I am a woman shooting, you know, I'm not, I'm not a big shopping guy <laughs> who can protect myself. So, yeah. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions from the audience? There's another question in the q and I can answer that. Uh, from Chutney. Hello, Chutney. I, uh, will you recommend having an accountability buddy or building a tribe to help you through the tough times? Yes, absolutely. I have, <laughs> again, Melanie is my accountability buddy. Um, and, you know, as I've, I guess, as I've become older and like really sort of learned um, the way I work and where I want to go with my practice, I realize like a lot of these things don't happen by yourself. You literally need a team of people um, to be there, whether it's supporting you emotionally, um, who are able to like point you in the right direction, um, guiding you in some ways. I think, um, you know, as a young artist, it's important to find a mentor. I mean, that's, that has really helped me grow tremendously just in the way I think about my practice critically. Um, 
it's, it's good to have a, a community of people who are doing work similar, similarly to you. So you could um, kind of thrash ideas out with and get feedback and um, yeah, you, you need that tribe. Absolutely. You can't, you can't operate in an isolated space and expect to, to make something impactful that's, um, that's meant to reach people. If you're making work for yourself and just for you, that's fine. But if you're putting it out there into the world, you do need that kind of community of people to help you refine it to a certain way. Wonderful. Well, everyone, can you give Nadia a round of applause? Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Thank you guys so much for listening. All right, oh, and thank you to all the online attendees. Um, I notice there's quite a few people in there. So thank you guys all for tuning in. Really appreciate it.